So how do we know if a model is good or bad? In this video, I will look at metrics for linear regression. It's basically a single number that can tell you how good or bad a particular linear regression model is. I should already say that it will be super important to actually watch some of the next videos about training, validation and test data, which tells you on which sets to calculate this metric. In this video, I will just basically talk through the different metrics that we have for evaluating linear regression models. I will also talk about how we can actually interpret linear regression models by looking at the coefficients or the parameter values and see what that can tell us about the data, but also importantly, what it can't tell us about the data. To evaluate a machine learning model, it's normally useful to have a single number that we can look at to tell us how good a particular model is. We're going to look at a few common metrics that are used specifically for regression. I should already say that it is crucial that you watch um, an upcoming video which shows how important it is to calculate these metrics on validation or test data, which means that it's data that is different from the set on which the model was trained. For now, you just need to know that you won't calculate these uh, metric numbers on the training set, the set that you use to fit the parameters or the parameter vector, but you're going to calculate these metrics on some other held out set. So the first potential metric is just the one that we actually use to train linear regression models, uh, the squared loss. So the idea is that you take n points that weren't seen during training and you just calculate the squared loss on those n points. One shortcoming of this metric is that its scale can actually be very different depending on how many items you have in this testing set. In other words, the metric will give you a very different score depending on the size of n because you just keep on adding up um, the squared error. So this motivates another metric that is often used or often reported called the mean squared error. And this metric normalizes the squared loss with the number of items. So the scale of this metric will be similar irrespective of how many items you have in your test set or your validation set. A final metric that's often reported is the root mean squared error, which, um, as you can probably guess from the name, is just the square root of the mean squared error. The advantage of this metric, just at a very intuitive level, is that it is roughly in the same scale as the original target output. And that's because you're taking the square root, which kind of brings the MSE, the mean squared error, back into the scale of the original Ys. Um, don't worry too much if that doesn't make sense and if you don't buy that, that argument. Electrical and electronic engineering students will be quite familiar with the root mean squared error because it's an indication of the power in a signal. So um, if you want to, you can think of um, the RMSE as an indication of the power in the error signal that you're getting from your model. I now want to briefly talk about how we can actually interpret the parameters from a linear regression model after we've fitted to some data, after we've learned the parameters and optimized them. So let's look at this example. Here we've got some data points, which I roughly indicated with these dots. We've got our input variable X, our feature from which we want to predict the scalar. We fit our model to this, we get our W0 and our W1. So what does W1 tell us in this case? Um, it will be a positive number. And the idea is that if we increase X by one unit, then um, our prediction will go up by W1. So we can think of W1, in this case, it's a positive number. So basically increasing X will increase the prediction from our model. Now, this is fictitious data, I won't lie, but let's pretend it's real data. And after I've shown you the data and I've shown you this model, I actually spoil it for you a little bit by telling you what Y is and why, what X is. So Y, the values that we want to predict, is actually ice cream sales. And X, our input uh, variable, our input feature, is actually shark attacks. And I know this data is made up, but this could actually happen. 
in the real world, ice cream sales actually do go up when we have more shark attacks. Maybe you can think why that's the case. So here's the answer. Uh, if you go and look in the real world, you will see that ice cream sales um, are also quite dependent on the temperature on that day. Um, so when the temperature is higher, when X is higher, we're going to have more ice cream sales. And that makes sense. When the temperature is higher, there's more people at the beach. But coincidentally, when there's more people at the beach, there's also more shark attacks. So W1 in these two cases, it does tell you something, but it doesn't tell you everything. Um, just because you have a positive and maybe even a very large W1 doesn't say that this X causes this um, prediction or this Y. So we can interpret uh, linear regression coefficients or linear regression uh, parameters, but we should just be careful when we do that. All that we can say is that if we have a large value here is that in the model, it does say that when I increase this thing, then my prediction will go up. And that is true even for the shark attacks ice cream example. It just doesn't mean that X shark attacks is actually causing ice cream sales. You could try and address this problem a little bit by going um, to a multiple linear regression model where, where, for example, we're trying to predict ice cream sales, but not just based on the temperature of the day, but on both the temperature of the day, which we can now call X1, and shark attacks uh, X2. And in this case, we can leave it up to the model. In a way, this model can use as much of the temperature information as it wants from this, um, from this parameter. And then if shark attacks do have an influence, then it will be captured in this, in this term. I would actually hope that if you did this on real data, that this W2 will have a very, very small number because all of the information uh, regarding ice cream sales would hopefully already be captured in the temperature here. But there's still limitations um, to doing this, to basically controlling for shark attacks um, in this example. This approach might not solve all our problems, especially if there's some other thing that's influencing ice cream sales, which are coincidentally also captured by um, shark attacks. The other problem is if you, even if you have a model, let's say one that goes from um, that tries to predict ice cream sales based on the temperature of the day. If I flip these two, then I can also try and predict the temperature of the day based on the ice cream sales. And clearly, ice cream sales does not cause the temperature of the day to rise or to lower, right? The ice cream salesman doesn't say, oh, I want to go have the, the temperature go up a little bit, so I'll sell more ice cream. You know, sometimes we wish that's the case if you're living in Scotland or something. But unfortunately, that's not what the world works like. So in the case of regression, it's not possible to just look at these coefficients and say what is causing what. Here's another example of this type of thing. So imagine I've got this idea that I'm going to use L1 regularization. Just as a reminder, that's, um, that's the lasso regularizer. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use it to pick the five most meaningful features in a problem where I have an input feature vector that's very large, that's like 100 dimensional. So we're going to vary the regularization parameter lambda until we have five non-zero um, parameters w. Just as a reminder, remember that the lasso actually causes parameters to um, basically stick to zero. It snaps to zero and then stay there. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a lambda large enough until we have exactly five non-zero W's. And the question is, are these five um, W's then the things that most cause the output Y? No, they're not the five things that most cause the output Y. They are just the best five values for predicting Y given a number of assumptions, things like that we're using a linear model and that we're using um, a, a regularization parameter. It could be that actually, you know, the 10th um, input feature causes Y a lot more closely, but that one of the others actually captures that 10th input feature, but also something else that's useful for predicting Y. So as a takeaway, I want to re-emphasize that linear regression models are actually um, interpretable to some extent. They are definitely more interpretable than some of the more advanced models like 
um, neural networks, but there are limitations to what you can read into the coefficients. Sometimes the most um, you know, honest thing you can really say is that these particular set of features are the most important or the most useful for predicting a particular output, given that we're making a linear assumption. And maybe that's already useful, but it's just important to um, not make too many extreme statements just based on the size of some of the coefficients. There is actually a lot of work in, in the machine learning and the statistics spaces around modeling causation. So how can we actually build models where we can make statements about what causes what? Um, and if you're interested in that, you can read something like the book of why. It's a nice book because it's a little bit like pop science-y. Um, it's a relatively easy read to see um, the basis for some of these models that um, capture causation. And you will actually see that some of the stuff that we covered in this lecture also fe features in that book. Finally, if you're interested in um, having a bit of fun, some of it is a little bit gloomy, but you can have a look at this link um, for examples of spurious correlations, cases where it seems like one thing is very, very indicative of another thing, and it's just way out stuff. So go and have a look at that if you're feeling a bit miserable and want to have a bit of a laugh.